Hello everybody. For people of a certain age like myself, the 1990s really was one of the best periods for performance cars. I think because we were starting to see slightly more complex, adventurous designs made possible thanks to advancements in materials technology and computer design, yet you still had that sort of human element. Things were still being styled and sculpted by eye, by hand, and things made to look right rather than being correct in the simulation. Cars were just that little bit more reliable but hadn't yet lost their character thanks to a whole bevy of emissions and other regulations. We had exciting stuff coming from all corners of the world, but there was perhaps no place more interesting at that point in time than Japan. Honda, Nissan, Mitsubishi, Toyota, Mazda and others were all creating some absolutely incredible cars, many of which have gone on to attain cult status and command a really serious premium today. By 2010 though, it seemed like the dream was over and the Japanese performance car was going to be consigned to the history books. Happily though, in the last few years, we seem to have seen something of a renaissance. The Honda NSX is back, the Toyota Supra is back, and many other manufacturers seem to be following suit. There is still an MX-5 on sale and it's perhaps one of the best ever. But maybe my favorite car from recent times to come out of Japan was the Lexus LC500. Striking to look at, an incredible engine and something I just didn't really expect to like, but I absolutely loved. Unfortunately, nobody in Britain actually bought one, but that hasn't stopped Lexus trying again. JM on Cars is kindly sponsored by Car Vertical, the only car history checking service you'll need, which references more than 20 databases globally to make sure you don't buy a car with a hidden past. For a special discount on the service, please use the link in the description down below. And now, today's feature presentation. This is the all new 2021 Lexus LC Convertible. It is one of the best cars I have ever driven. It has a fantastic engine, striking looks, and is available at a very reasonable price. Yet I'm pretty convinced absolutely nobody is going to buy one. Why is that? Well, it's complicated. At the heart of it, this is really a fairly simple car. It is the familiar LC500 with a folding soft top roof. And quite a nice folding soft top roof too. Lexus say it looks just as good with the roof up as it does down. That I disagree with because no soft top car looks good roof up. However, the roof itself is very impressive. Compared with the SL63 I drove recently, this thing feels like it goes down in fast forwards. A very impressive mechanism and you can operate it at speeds of up to about 30 mile an hour. The regular LC500 you can also get with a V6 hybrid setup that comes with a weird complicated sort of eCVT gearbox. They decided not to make one of those in convertible form, I think because nobody was going to buy it, but also because apparently packaging this car would have then been very difficult indeed. Trying to hide the convertible roof and also store all of the batteries and things apparently was a step too far. As it is, this car has had to lose the all-wheel steer that the regular car gets, but honestly, that's not something I've really noticed the loss of. As promised, this is indeed an excellent car, and there are many, many reasons why you would want to buy it. If we look at, say, the SL63 as the benchmark, that's a car I said had to be equal parts cruiser and bruiser. Well, as a cruiser, I would say this is, well, at least the equal of that car. It's extraordinarily comfortable. Seriously, one of the most refined cars I've ever been in. And there is this pervasive sense of quality in everything that you touch. This car feels really solid, which it really should do when it weighs 2.1 tonnes. The regular car was not exactly a flyaway and lopping the roof off hasn't really helped matters. What is disappointing though is the fact that in that process it seems to have lost quite a bit of rigidity and considering the regular car was I think even stiffer than the LFA you would have thought that it would have had some to spare but apparently not and this car does have a little bit of scuttle shake on anything less than a perfectly smooth road. Regrettably anything less than a perfectly smooth road is exactly the kind of road that I drive on all the time but it's not quite so much that I can't forgive it. 
So let's talk numbers, shall we? Well, that engine produces 464 horsepower, 530 newton meters of torque, it's about 400 pound feet. And those are actually just a, a little bit down on previous cars. Those had about 477 horsepower, so you've lost about 13 or so. And that is no doubt due to the ever tightening emissions and sound regulations. I know you're not really going to notice the loss of sort of 13 horsepower in a car like this, but it does just bug me that Lexus didn't somehow find a way to make all of those changes and keep the power figure same as it was. Everyone else has, so I don't know why they couldn't. It is, as you can probably tell, a 2 plus 2, and when the seats aren't all the way back, as they will be in some of my shots, there's a little bit of room in the back seats. Now, it's not quite as much as you would find in, say, the Maserati Gran Cabrio, which is a, a genuine four-seater, but it is more than you get in the Merc SL, which is a strict two-seater. I'd say this is on par, probably, with sort of Jaguar XK, 911, that sort of stuff. So they're, they're sort of very, very occasional rear seats. Stowage space in the boot is actually pretty good, and, and that's a pleasant surprise, because I wasn't sure it was going to be any good. Because this is a folding soft top too, unlike many other cars with hard top roofs, you don't get any more or less boot space whether the roof is up or down. It's a shame too that they somehow found the budget to make this, but not the proposed LCF, which would have been an even sportier version of the LC500 Coupe. Many of the things that I absolutely loved about that car are present and correct here. The interior is really quite special, some wonderful shapes in here, really nice quality leather. The dash is really cool too, it's got a little party piece where the actual mechanical element of it will move over when you press the menu. And even the little Lexus touchpad here, I don't actually hate as much as many other people do. It's not the best, I will concede, and there are definitely better methods of navigating through your menus available. However, compared with some of the more modern stuff I've driven that has just touch capacitive buttons and touch screens for everything, it's actually quite nice. And to be honest, you've got Android Auto and all that jazz, so you just plug your phone in, you set your nav up, and then I just talk to it for all the other stuff I want to do, and you've got controls on the steering wheel for your seek and your volume and all that kind of stuff. It's a reasonably large car, but not enormous, and I have to say, but just driving around town, it is the most wonderful thing. I went up to Scotland not too long ago in a Lamborghini Huracan, and that was not a particularly enjoyable journey up. The car was great when I was actually in Scotland, but for the business of getting to Scotland, I feel like this would be the perfect car. If it weren't for what I think is this vehicle's major issue, that's the wind. Now, this might seem very obvious in a car with no roof on it, but most other convertibles that I have driven have all been actually pretty good. They've all been set up to deal with the fact that you are going to have this great big hole pointed roughly skywards. There is an optional wind deflector that you can buy for these cars, but this one hasn't been supplied with it. And that is a shame because once you're above about 50 mile an hour, there is a lot of wind in this car. And that's combined with an AC system that isn't particularly effective. Roof up, absolutely fine. It will blow very hot, it will blow very cold, but it will not blow very hard. And that's really quite annoying because I took it the other day up to Silverstone, about a hundred mile journey, and it was 21 degrees, which is pretty warm for the UK, and I was cold in here. I was really chilly. I was thinking about putting the roof up, and that's just that's tragic. Particularly concerning, I think, because one of this car's major audiences must be the elderly. I mean, seriously, it is a £100,000 Lexus convertible. If anything else, this particular car is clearly aimed at the retiree living his life in southern Florida. There's no more Miami car I think I can possibly imagine than this. This is the quintessential American retiree's car, and it would do very well out there. However, old people love to be warm. My girlfriend's grandfather, his house was like a furnace. My grandmother lives next to the radiator, so I don't think it really appealed to them all that much. But then for young people, you see, there's a bigger problem because this car doesn't really appear to be very sporty. It's very, very heavy, much heavier than anything beyond, say, a Merc SL63. It also doesn't have masses of power. Yeah, 460 odd is quite a lot, but it's not quite as much as the Jaguar F-Type all-wheel drive 575. 
and it's still not as fast as a 911 Cabriolet, which has a lot less power, but is also so much lighter, it will just walk away from this. So is that a car then that's just not enjoyable to drive fast? Ah, uh, quite the contrary, actually. speed to the side for one moment, what you'll find here is one of the most enjoyable luxury driver's cars around. It's absolutely sensational. Yes, there's that little bit of scuttle shake and ultimately its ability is hampered by the sheer mass of the thing, but the steering is quite direct. It's got a reasonable weighting to it, perfect for this kind of car. And that engine and gearbox, oh my word! The gearbox in particular seems to come under fire from a lot of commentators because it has too many speeds. Yeah, that is true, it's got 10 of them. That's more than anyone I think requires. And a lot of people said, oh, they're, they're spaced out too far. Well, the truth is what they've done essentially is just taken the normal ratios for sort of one through eight really, and then just stuck two more on top. And that's good because if you did try and sort of cram 10 ratios into six gears worth of speed, you'd just be forever changing up and down. That being said, I think they could have made the first six just a little bit shorter because by the time you're at the top of second, you're already doing more or less the speed limit on a road like this. And that engine really only does its best work above 4,000 RPM. However, we did some drive-bys this morning for which I roped in my good buddy James Dean and I thought he was going to hate this car because it has scuttle shake. It's got no pull below about 4,000 RPM. You know, it's a, a Lexus convertible. He loved it. He came back with a massive smile on his face because, unlike many other far faster, more potent cars, you really do need to drive this really hard to make it go quickly. And that's fun, particularly fun when the gearbox is as good to use as this. I mean, listen to these downshifts. And the upshift as well. It's a combination, I think, between a sort of automatic, a dual clutch, with maybe a hint of old sort of single clutch box in there. Listen. That's a quick shift. The paddle's absolutely brilliant, and this thing flows with the road so well. I have even on occasion actually used sport mode, and I never use sport mode in any cars, but here, absolutely perfectly calibrated wonderful brilliant comfort mode is genuinely one of the nicest rides in a car i've encountered in a long time and that includes stuff like bentley's and the like in sport mode it just firms up the car enough to give you a little bit more control a little bit more confidence and it all just comes together Okay, maybe I'd like it to be just a little bit more raucous. The old coupe, I think, was, especially the early ones. But this still makes a noise. It's, it's not silent, that's for sure. It is a lovely thing to drive. It truly is. I know the looks are a little bit divisive, but they're quite striking. And let's be honest here, this couldn't have come from anywhere other than Japan. The interior is special as well. Everything in here is just quality. The shapes, the materials, it's really rather nice. And this particular car, this exact car, £100,000, because it's the Sport Plus variant, that gets you slightly bigger wheels, it gets you a limited slip diff at the back, which you do on occasion need. It also gets you slightly nicer leather in here, gets you carbon fibre kick plates, all sorts of stuff. There's only two options you can choose. Those are the Mark Levinson stereo and the all-colour heads-up display with a fancy keycard to get you in the car. I'd say tick both of those options. The heads-up display is actually really very good. And the Mark Levinson is, is okay, but if this stereo was two and a half grand, like it would be with most other manufacturers, I'd be struggling to recommend it to you. But at about a grand, no, it, it's well worth having for sure. So then, it's a good looking car. It's fast enough, great to drive, very high quality, 
nobody's going to buy it. And that's not just down to the scuttle shake and the fact it gets a bit chilly when you're on the move. No, I think the problem is people just won't ever give it a chance. Young people wouldn't even give it a look in. It's got the wrong badge on it. Here in the UK, Lexus is a really, really weird brand. The original LC500 just never sold. I hardly see any of them ever. The Kia Stinger is practically commonplace by comparison and those themselves are still very rare. Making it into a convertible is going to make it even weirder, even quirkier. It's made it a little bit more expensive, even harder, I think, to justify because people will inevitably do the whole used versus new comparison and then for £100,000 used, you can get a lot of car. The SL63 that I tried the other day was a lot faster equally as well put together, had loads of toys in it, and um, about 60 grand, so it's a lot of car for quite a bit less money than this. Obviously this being new, you can't get a used one yet. You could be very brave and get a Ferrari California. Whether that's a good idea or not, I'll be finding out very soon. If you then look at, say, a 911 C2S with a little bit of spec, that's actually closer to £120,000. That's even more than this. And that doesn't seem right at all because this is a far nicer place to be with a far more special powertrain. Maybe not quite as effective because of the weight of it, but this really does feel like you're getting your money's worth. The Porsche just doesn't. So young people, I don't think, are really going to buy it. It's also still a lot of money for a young person's car. For the elderly, I just think that maybe even it's too spicy a car for a lot of people to go for. You know, do you really want Grandad having a, a 460 horsepower V8 automatic that when he puts his foot all the way down it, it really will move? Not sure I'd have trusted my Grandad with that. But for those few people who are brave enough to overlook badge snobbery and this car's few faults, you're going to find something quite remarkable. And more than that, because it is a Lexus, it's probably never going to break. And even better, Lexus have now introduced something called Lexus Relax. And, and I really quite like that, not only because it's a little bit punny, but because it's actually quite a cool idea. So what it is, is you take your car to Lexus for servicing, and then, once you've obviously got outside your sort of initial warranty period, you get your car serviced, and when you get that done, you get an extra 10,000 miles and one year worth of warranty. The idea being, because you're going to service it every year, you're going to join the dots, and you're going to get continuous warranty up to 100,000 miles or 10 years old. 10 years worth of warranty on a Lexus that you're probably not going to need anyway, because it's probably never going to break. Lexus dealers also happen to be extraordinarily nice. I've dealt with a couple of them and they've always been really, really friendly, very good people. The whole Lexus customer service thing is very important to the company, as is the quality. Most brands will give you some sort of spiel about, you know, how they're better than everybody else. The difference with the Lexus is that I believe it. Would I buy one? Uh, probably not. I need to try it with the wind deflector to see if that fixes the problem because that, that, that is for me quite a big issue. I am the sort of person that wants to drive a car with the roof down at every single available opportunity and as it is this car just isn't quite good enough for that and that's a crying shame and a, and a small piece of sort of overlooked design that really surprises me from a company like Lexus because everything else in here seems to be fairly well thought through down to the fact that even the little drawer here is so really well damped it closes on its own and it slows down as it comes to closing so it's not a sort of sharp snappy little thing that's wonderful <laughs> somebody out there could go and buy one of these, I would be very grateful because hopefully then Lexus won't stop making them. Because my life, they're good cars.